Welcome to this lesson of the Paul Garchas University. In this lesson, we'll talk about the importance of open files, how to take advantage of them, or how to even create them. Then, a different topic, we'll talk about past pawns and how to catch them, if we can, or how not to allow our opponent to catch our own past pawn. And then, of course, will end with a beautiful, brilliant position at the end. The position we see right now on the board is a very closed position. In fact, there isn't a single open file. We have to notice that both knights are beautifully centralized on d4 and e4. They are on very nice outposts from which they can hardly be kicked out. On the other hand, there is a major difference between the two bishops. And that's because of the pawn structure. While white's bishop is behind a chain of blocked pawns all on dark squares, limiting greatly the mobility of the bishop on d2, Black's bishop, on the other hand, can potentially attack, target all of those pawns. It's a typical situation of a good bishop versus bad bishop case. However, as so often in closed positions, the question is how to make progress? Well, the only way to make progress in these situations is if the stronger side can open some files and to target better the weaknesses, in this case, white's pawns. It's quite clear that black's first move should be a5, trying to open the a file. If now white captures the pawn, black would simply recapture and then double up the rooks on the A file targeting white's A2 pawn and even tripling up perhaps at a later point with the two rooks and the queen all attacking white's pawn on A2. In the actual game which was played between Vasiliev and Zilberstein, white played A3. This is a very typical response, trying to keep the balance and to be able to recapture with a pawn on b4 and keep the position closed. Right now, if black immediately captures, white would recapture with the a pawn because the rook in the corner is solidly protected by the other rook. So here comes a very important idea that I suggest you remember not to rush in opening that file. Luckily for black, it's up to him to choose when he wants to open it. So here is what black did. First doubled up the rooks while he could. And white, of course, is not much that can, he can do played knight e2, doubled up the rooks on the a file, and now, on the other hand, there is a serious threat. There is a threat to capture the pawn on b4, and now no longer can white recapture with the a pawn because there is a dual attack on the rook in the corner, and white would lose a rook. It wouldn't help white, in this case, to protect the rook on a1, because then the queen would be overworked. Remember, the queen is also busy protecting that bishop on d2. So here, black would continue by pawn take pawn. If the a pawn takes, then black would simply trade all four rooks in the corner on a1, and then pick up the free piece on d2. Let's go back a couple of moves. Uh, 
and again talk a moment more about queen b2 pawn takes if white takes back with the c pawn in that case black wins a pawn by capturing the bishop and then the a3 pawn let's go back again to this position when black doubled up the two rooks on the a file so white's only choice to avoid the immediate loss of material was moving the rook out of the way also by the way trading on a5 would result pretty much immediately losing the pawn on a3 because the black bishop and the two rooks are all targeting that pawn Again, we're going back to this position where white responded by rook a to b1, getting out of that pin. And now the time is ripe to trade and open the a file. White takes back with the a pawn, not to lose that pawn on a3. And black is ready to enter with the rooks. The most natural move, moving the rook to a2, actually does not accomplish quite what it almost does because the white queen is not forced to move away from the attack but white could also just block it so black therefore rather moved in this position the rook only to a3 the great thing for black is in these positions that black is in no rush black can slowly but surely improve the position of all his pieces before the actual action time. White played knight g3 hoping to trade that knight which is beautifully positioned for black and black moved the other rook up to a4. It's so typical that when there is an open file it's ideal to have the queen as the last piece behind. So black is trying to put the queen behind the two rooks. And now white traded knights and that resulted in opening another file, the d file. White played rook f2 and another typical idea for such situations queen d3 putting the queen in this outpost if white would trade black would simply take back probably with either pawn and create a protected past pawn after which black would play I think similarly to the game putting both rooks on the second rank White did not trade in the meantime but moved the queen away while holding on to the rook on b1 and now rook a2. When we occupy an open file our dream typically is to try to double up our rooks in the opponent's second rank and we'll see a perfect example of that in this game. White moved the queen to e1 and came rook to c2. White is quite helpless against black's plan. Came rook d1 and finally both rook, rooks are on the second rank of white. White played g3. Bishop d8 regrouping the bishop to b6 if white does nothing putting then pressure on the e3 pawn. White played bishop c1, trapping black's queen, but black is ready for it. Rook captured rook on f2. And after rook captures queen, an important intermediate check making sure white will not have the opportunity to give up his queen for the two rooks and only after king f1 black captured 
the second rook on d3 and it's quite obvious that white's position is hopeless with those two rooks paralyzing white's position. A quite amazing and instructive example on how to occupy an open file and then how to take advantage of it and double up the rooks on a second rank. Let's move on to a different subject and that is catching past pawns. This is a very famous endgame position by the famous endgame composer Raiti. Let's look at the situation, what's going on. White has a far advanced passed pawn on c6 that's only two squares away from promotion. However, if white will try to push that pawn, the black king will move right next to it and catch it, while the white king can never catch the black pawn on h5. And yet, white can save this game. The big question is, how? Normally, when a king is behind a pawn, behind a passed pawn, it can never ever catch it. I suggest you take a few minutes and try to figure out the solution yourself if you don't yet know it. Well, if you haven't figured it out yet, the solution is trying to combine catching that black passed pawn with trying to support the promotion of the white pawn. And the way to accomplish that is by moving the king to g7. And then black pushes the pawn, moving the king to f6. Wow, the black pawn is almost there, h3. True, but now the white king is close enough and can move to e7. So after h2, c7, white already threatens to promote, and after king b7, the king simply moves next to, next to the pawn, from protecting the pawn, and of course, protecting the promotion square, so both pawns promote at the same time. Amazing, isn't it? Let's go back again to the starting position. How did we do this? King g7. But how about if in this position, after h4, king f6, the black king moves next to the white pawn right away? And this is the tricky part. This is when the white king combines the two ideas the catching the black pawn by playing king e5. So after king takes pawn, king f4, and it's quite obvious that white caught black pawn right on time. Or if in this position black pushes the h pawn, then the white king right on time gets to d6, followed by h2, c7, pawn promotion, and white promotes also right on time. And finally, what about if after king g7, black plays king b6 right away? Well, the answer is quite similar. By playing king to f6, if king takes pawn king g5, or if black pushes the pawn to h4, then again, what's the move? Yes, you're right. Again, king to e5, combining the threat to catch the pawn and to help our own pawn to promote. An amazing example of solving the seemingly impossible. I decided this to be a fun lesson. And the next example is a lot of fun and very instructive at the same time. I agree it doesn't happen quite too often to have all eight pawns still on the board while all the other minor and major pieces being gone. Nevertheless, it's a perfect example to demonstrate 
pawn breakthroughs and how to create past pawns. Also, I think it's a great example to demonstrate how space advantage can be important. The position is completely symmetrical except for the fact that the white pawns are on the fourth rank and not on the third. If all of those white pawns would be on the third rank, the position would be completely symmetrical. Because of the fact that the white chain of pawns are one rank ahead of blacks towards the promotion square, that gives white the opportunity to create a passed pawn and to make sure that white arrives first. Again, as usual, I suggest you take a little pause and try to figure out the solution actually yourself. Amazingly, there is only one correct solution here. For example, starting with pushing the A-pawn first, White would already give up the opportunity to win the game after take. Neither would work to push the B pawn because black would capture with the C pawn and then if white would try the typical trick sacrificing a second pawn and then playing C5 would result the black king being close enough to the promotion square on C8. Black would simply trade pawns and then Black is not even in a rush to move his king. He could start by pushing his own pawn and would, of course, still catch White's pawn right on time. So what's the solution? Amazingly, the solution is pushing the middle pawn on d5. But how does this help? Well, let's check it out. Let's see one of the main variations. Pawn, e pawn takes. E pawn takes. And C pawn takes. What should Y do now? Well, if white captures back, then black could do many things, but among them, just play B5. And there is no way white can create a passed pawn which the black king wouldn't catch. So let's go back. d5 is the first correct move. e takes, e takes, c takes. And this is the moment when white can and should play a5. b takes and b5. Now, if black pushes a pass pawn, the A pawn for example, which the white king is too far to catch, then white can capture and of course white arrives just one move earlier than black and wins easily. Let's go back again. D5 takes, takes, takes and A5. Remember that was the key move pawn takes and b5. But what if black takes, pawn takes? Now remember, white is down two pawns already and the black king is catching that pawn. So what do we do? Well, now we push the b pawn, but the king is still catching, pushing the b pawn. And here comes the beautiful moment that we create a second passed pawn by playing g5. And this is the famous trick. By sacrificing two of the pawns, we create the third one being a passed pawn. a4, f6, a3, f7, a2, and very importantly, we give up one of the passed pawns forcing the black king to capture the new queen. So the final pawn arrives with a check and then we easily catch black's a pawn 
and the queen wins without much difficulty, even though black has six pawns at this moment, but I bet you can believe quite easily that white will win this game. Amazing pawn and game, isn't it? When I first saw it, I was very, very impressed. And believe me, I was already a grandmaster when I first saw it. So I hope you really enjoy this. And finally, the last position is an unusual one again. Imagine, look at this position. Looks quite unreal, doesn't it? But it's not one of those situations when white would have many ways to win and we just need to find the shortest one. In reality, white has only one way to win. In fact, white can checkmate in 10 moves. But it's quite cute. Look at this. The first move is moving the rook to g1, creating a checkmate threat with bishop to d7. There is only one thing black can do to solve this. Ha moving the rook wouldn't help because it would be still bishop d7 checkmate. The only move is to move the queen to g4. Now, bishop takes, renewing that threat on d7. But pawn takes. Wow, look at this position. Black has all eight pawns. And believe me, if now white would capture that rook on a3, it would be black who wins with all these past pawns running down. But then, what can white do? Capturing the pawn on g4 would be too slow because black would move the rook to a2 and get his king out of the bind and of course being so many pawns up, even if white captures a few, Black would still have plenty left to win, believe me. So let's go back. What can white do here? You'll be amused what you're about to see now. White plays rook to c1. Look at that. Threatening checkmate. And again, the black rook moving wouldn't help the situation because rook takes would still be checkmate. So black has only one choice, moving his pawn up to c3. And what do we do now? Again, capturing black's rook wouldn't help. Capturing black's pawn on c3 would not help either because it would not create any real threat and would give black time to push his pawn. So again, what we need to do is Threaten with checkmate. Every single move in this endgame, actually, the only way we can win if we keep threatening checkmate. Now, white wants to capture the pawn on d4 with a checkmate. The only move for black is to push the d-pawn. I bet you got an idea now what to do. Move the rook to e1 and threaten to checkmate on e4. Black pushes the pawn and guess what? Rook f1, threatening to checkmate. Pawn f3, and rook to g1. Only move, pushing the pawn, and rook h1, finally, the final threat on h4. Now, when the pawn pushes, finally, we can capture it because there is no pawn on an i file, which doesn't exist. Right? And now, black finally is helpless against the checkmate with rook h4. What an amazing position, isn't it? I was really, really thrilled. This is the starting position. Again, the first move was rook to g1. With the amazing threat of bishop to d7. Only move was to block it. Bishop takes. Pawn takes. And now the rook chase of the pawns started with rook c1, and you know the rest. Well, I hope you learned some, had a lot of fun. We had some three really remarkable compositions in this lesson. By the way, the first one I mentioned, the pawn endgame, was by Reiti. 
The second one with the eight pawns on each side was by Chatignol. And finally, the last composer was Korolikov. Congratulations to all those amazing composers. I hope you really enjoyed this lesson. And we'll be back with more instruction next week and more beautiful, amazing brilliances. Thank you for listening and so long until next week. Mm -hmm.